Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage, the Vault Series. Today's clip was shot back in September of 2007 in our original museum location. My good friend Doug Roberts had invited his good friend and one of my favorite singers of all time, Gary Puckett, from Gary Puckett and the Union Gap, to come over, see the museum, and he actually did a private concert for us. After the concert, we stood up in the hallway of the museum, we stood up right in front of the famous Quonset Hut CBS Studio B door, and we did this interview. I left in one question that I didn't intend to. I, I said, Gary, this is just for me, but I think you might enjoy the answer as well. I wanted to know what it was like to be Gary Puckett of the Union Gap during those heady times of music during the 60s in Southern California. Once again, my good friend Gary Puckett. If you enjoy it, please hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. What's your first memories of wanting to be in music? Actually, my first memories of really wanting to be a singer were probably when I was about, I'd say 12, somewhere along there where Elvis had really kind of come on the scene, you know, and he, he was doing that train I ride thing, and um, boy did I get turned on to that rockabilly sound, Scotty Moore, et cetera, Gene Vincent, um, Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, I was just really knocked out by that kind of music. As a boy at six years old, my parents sat me down at a piano and they said, we want you to learn to play piano. And really the first thing I ended up doing when I escaped that classical idea and rock and roll came along was a whole lot of shaking going on. You know, and I, I just, from there I found a guitar in my grandmother's attic that had five strings on it. It was an old acoustic guitar, but the first thing that I played was Honky Tonk. And um, that was the music that really lit a fire in my soul, you know. The, the uh, groups, the platters, the coasters, um, oh, who were the others that, that preceded them even, but you know, in that, that era in time, the Everly Brothers, um, Jerry Lee, Gosh, uh, um, why do names go by the wayside when I put on the spot? Elvis, of course. Uh, um, so many from that that era just made this thing happen. So eventually, you know, I got into a band. I was 15. They were called the Redcoats. We played at the Sock Ops. We, you know, it was just it was kind of a lark because I was always expected to go to college be something important, study, get educated. And uh, I guess I got a different kind of education though, didn't I? The Redcoats? The Redcoats, you knew that. Um, did you make up the name? I, honestly, I don't know who made up the name, but we wore red coats. A and, prelude? Uh, yeah, I guess so, I, I guess so. Um, I suppose it was somewhat of a prelude. I never thought about that. Uh, but, um, you know, as a 15, 16 year old, it was exciting to play at the sock hop and and you know, see the pretty girls and how they reacted to the music and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, well, as a sidelight, as a little point of interest, Barry Curtis, who uh, has been the guitar player for many, many years for the Kingsmen, he and I were kids together and we were in the Redcoats together. But um, you know, that sort of spiraled into things later because I did go to college for a couple of years, threw my books over the bridge one day and said, uh, I'd rather be in music, you know, so I really sort of jumped into it both feet and started working in the clubs in San Diego, but, you know, I was continuing to listen to the Stax group, the Motown records, the Beatles, the, you know, the music that was a part of our era playing that music, Wilson Pickett, Eddie Floyd, Steve Cropper, I loved his guitar playing, um, that, that was the stuff. Um, did you ever take formal lessons of any kind? Uh, piano lessons, yes, for about four Not years, guitar? six to about ten years old. But uh, after that, a few guitar lessons along the way, and I had a few vocal lessons, but they were more lessons how to warm up, how to preserve it, as opposed to how to sing. God gave me the gift of song in that sense. So, so I've been fortunate that way. I, you know, like others, it gets a little beat up from the road and things, but that's normal. So, we'll f let's fast forward a little bit. Um, when did you actually get your first recording contract? 
Well, the first real one um, was in the summer of 1967. It was around June or July that we actually signed contracts in San Diego with Columbia Records. And uh, Jerry Fuller, who was to be our producer, uh, well, to back up a little bit, I had put together a portfolio. That portfolio had pictures of this new band called the Union Gap. Um, we were dressed in the Civil War outfits, period 1861-65. Um, we, took, we took sort of action shots of us at a ghost town outside of San Diego that was a tourist attraction, sort of a mini uh, Bush Gardens, and uh, put the pictures in the portfolio, the demo in the portfolio, um, lyrics to songs I had written, took it to all the record companies, and I found Jerry Fuller, who was uh, a new staff producer at Columbia Records, and um, he had had success in his home state of Texas. As a songwriter, he had worked with uh, the Knickerbockers. I think he produced that record. He had written Traveling Man for Ricky Nelson, uh, and as an artist, he had made some minor hits, so he came to L.A. looking for work in the music business. And I put my portfolio on his desk as he was hanging his gold record award for Rick Nelson's Traveling Man. And that's how we started. He said, where can I see this band? I said, in San Diego at a club called The Quad Room. He came on Friday saying he was going to be there Saturday. And I was kind of coasting through the night, trying to be in good shape for the next night. And he walked up to the stage about midnight and he said, hey, how's it going? I almost didn't recognize him, you know, so. Then he said, sounds great, let's go make a record. So we sat outside the club in the bowling alley itself, um, talked about the, you know, the possibilities, and he said, well, I'll be back with contracts. And he came back about four weeks later, which was uh, late June, early July, maybe, uh, of 67. And we signed them in the bowling alley. And uh, August 17th of 67, we recorded our first real recording, which was Woman, Woman, Have You Got Cheating on Your Mind. Before that, I had sort of had something on the fringe um, with a couple of guys called the DiMartino Brothers, and they had a group called the Cascades, and the Cascades had a wonderful record called um, Listen to the Rhythm of the Falling Rain. And uh, Andy DiMartino and his brother Augie wanted to produce the band I was in prior to the Union Gap, and they did. It was a record called... Um, um, uh, phew, I'm forgetting it now. It was called, a group called The Outcasts. It was called Runaway, a different song than Del Shannon. But it was a good record, uh, but it wasn't destined for any greatness. It was just rock and roll. But the first real record was Woman, Woman on Columbia Records. So, um, take us in the studio. First walked in the studio. Where, what studio did you record? What an awesome feeling. Columbia Records on Sunset Boulevard. Four studios. A, studio A was the big studio and they could bring in a whole orchestra. Um, and they did, and I was in a vocal booth in the middle as the strings and the horns and the rhythm section and everything was placed in a circle around me. And when the drums went da -ka -da, and the strings went and glissed, and I was just so overcome with the sound of it in my earphones that I just, I just nearly broke down and cried, you know, I just kind of went, you guys are going to have to go on without me and I'm going to overdub, but they, the track of course was recorded live um, with all those greats that you have here, uh, Hal Blaine and Larry Nechtel and Mike Dacey and, and other names that I'm forgetting right at the moment, you can probably name them all for me, but. So it was always the, the session players from the, start. the first two records, the first two albums were the session players because Columbia Records and Jerry himself, who was given um, responsibility for the budget and so forth and for the, the songs, the recording. I mean, he was the producer and he was in the driver's seat. And he didn't know if the Union Gap could record as it turned out. They were talented enough to do so. And on the third record, we uh, cut all the tracks ourselves. in fact, wrote all the songs. So um, the group actually proved to be a musically talented and capable band. When you went in the studio, um, how, many, how many sides, how long did it take you to cut Woman Woman? Well, actually, it probably was 50 minutes because in those days, as you know, um, it was kind of by the clock and by the book. They were all uh, union 
players and they all came in and sessions were three hours and you tried to get three songs done. And in this case, our three hour session with the 10 minute breaks or whatever that they got per hour, we did three songs, Woman, Woman, um, Don't Make Promises You Can't Keep, which was a Tim Harden song and a song that um, I had written, as a matter of fact, called, uh, uh, oh, I forgot the name of that one, isn't that something? It turned out to be on the, on the album, but uh, Believe Me was the title of it. But in the three hours, you know, and they, being union, obviously you had to, when that clock said that's the end, that was the end or it cost the record company a lot of money. So we got three songs done in three hours, and that was normally the routine with Jerry. When it came to re overdubbing at some point, we started to get a little more relaxed because the union didn't uh, you know, enter into the picture. So, um, Young Girl, is that the same scenario? Uh, pretty much, yeah. That was the second single and um, was on the second album. So it was in the, in the early uh, wave you know, of what the Union Gap was doing. So those were, those were still free song sessions? Yes, they were. Up to the third album, which became a little more relaxed because though we were musician, a musician, we were uh, uh, in the union, they, they weren't standing there on top of us uh, because we could, I, I don't know what that ruling was, but we took more time getting the tracks together. First time you went in there, and I, you know, you get, I guess you get used to anything after you do it for a while, you yeah. know, you realize this is how it goes, but, but um, the woman, woman, or young girl. Um, those were were those guitar or piano vocals, and then the band heard that, or were they were, the, were they full blown demos when they brought them in? Or they weren't demos. They Jerry wrote a song. Uh, woman, woman was a song already recorded by a group called Tom Paul and the Glazer Brothers, and as you know, uh, Jim Glazer. Uh, did he write that alone or with somebody? I'm forgetting now, but uh, Jim Glazer wrote it, maybe co-wrote it, but um, they recorded it on Columbia Records. Jerry Fuller had heard the record and loved the song. It was a country record and therefore a little bit different. And they didn't do the whoa, woman thing wasn't in there. It was like woman, woman, have you got cheating now on your mind? But he loved the song, so we, um, he says, we'll just work on it, we'll make it a pop record. And of course we did, we had strings and horns and all that stuff, but that was the record he wanted to record. Glenn Campbell loved the song. He was ready to record it and they were having this little race to get in the studio and Glenn and Jerry were good friends. I found Jerry, Jerry got the recording contracts. We got in the studio um, and Jerry said, I'm gonna invite Glenn over to play guitar. So Glenn came over, played guitar on Woman, Woman, and the other two songs, which is a nice memory. Howard Roberts was on those sessions. Uh, I'm pretty sure Carol Kay was on those first sessions. Uh, Hal Blaine. Um, and then we got to work with, you know, the other greats. There was a, oh, a drummer, uh, oh, what was his name? Earl. Earl Palmer. Earl, yes. Oh. What a great drummer he was too, uh, and others. You know, so many great players, and and it was just awesome being in the studio with the string sections and the the horn sections because they were all so accomplished. You know, but when Jerry wrote "Young Girl," that wasn't a demo. It was a song that he he wrote down the lyric and the chords, and he taught it to me. And he got with Al Caps and said, "Here's the song," and Al went, "Okay," and that's what they did. That was the first time we all heard it when we were you know put on the earphones in the studio. It just it, it came to life just like that. Just like that, yeah. Those uh, those well, as you know, Glenn Campbell was an original member of, of the Wrecking Crew. You know of the of the Wrecking Crew. Yeah, yeah. Or, or what was known as the Wrecking Crew. That I knew that he was one of the the main guys at the time, but he was starting to have his own success, so he was out on the road a lot, and you know, and in fact, that's how I met Glenn. Uh, we, we met in Phoenix, I think, uh, working in the same great big club, kind of like one of those uh, Gillies sort of places, you know. I think he was upstairs and I was down or something like that. And we said hello and he said, hey, come with me. And we jumped in his Corvette and off we went, you know. So it, it, was, it was high times. It was a lot of fun. What other studios do you remember recording in, in or did y'all record in other than Columbia or was it always Columbia? It was almost always Columbia Records. Um, a little bit was done in the uh, in the church in New York City mm -hmm. uh, at Columbia, but not a whole lot. Um, Clive Davis 
generally liked a West Coast group to be West Coast. He liked, I mean, he was a fan, and that's something I liked about the business in those days. It was fun that way. The record company presidents, they were fans, and they liked to hang out with the artists. It wasn't just business to them, though you must admit he was one of the brilliant ones who knew how to mix, hang out with business. And, um, uh, but being a West Coast group, we were sort of under the auspices, if that's the right word, of uh, Jack Gold. And, um, you know, I knew the, Jack. Yeah, you knew Jack. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, I knew him after he had become ill yeah. with um, Parkinson's. Parkinson's. Whatever. Yeah. But uh, Billy Sherrill was a huge fan of, oh, of, yeah. of, of Jack's, and they were fans and friends of each other, and that's, that's really how I met him. But, yeah. So this is something for me now. I mean, just for me. What was it like? Basically, to be on top of the world, in my in my in my book, from for if I could if I could have a, a, a material dream, I can't hardly much think of one better than maybe what you lived um, as a as an artist that had the records that you had that was there at that particular time and place. Not only where you could turn on AM radio and hear everything, just about everything in in here. You heard on the radio, from country to to blues to to metal, Stax, Motown, Beach Boys, Beatles. Everything was on AM radio. Right. So, um, but to have huge, not just number one, but huge number one records, and be in that in that that dream world it seemed like of palm trees in the in in the silhouettes in the sunshine of southern california or you know and driving down sunset boulevard and and going to the pacific coastline and and driving to Monte, uh, santa monica and and in and, and having the convertible corvettes and living that life what was that like you just described it you know i mean being on top of the world is like being on top of the Everybody's dream is a little different, but my words are overwhelming, um, faster than absolute heck. You know, it was it, it was um, a wild, fun, exciting, um, s sometimes a little fearful times. You know, because you were, for instance, doing Ed Sullivan. Now, to me, that was a rush more than a rush because as a kid I watched Topo Gijo, you know, after, um, you know, Don Rickles or something like that. And I never in my wildest dreams thought that I would be on the Ed, I saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show. Would I ever be on Ed Sullivan? Never entered my mind. Being on, on Ed Sullivan, not only was a high, it was frightening because you realized and they told you now be sure that you stand here and you do this like whatever you're going to do because eight, nine million people or whatever it was are watching you and it was live. It was not something where you had them play a track. I mean, they played a music track and I sang live. So it was a bit of the hair of the dog, if you know what I mean. But those are my words, exciting, overwhelming, fantastic, you know. Things have changed, but they change in, in some things have definitely changed for the better, but, not, but in other, but other ways, being on TV now, can never, in my mind, compare to what you just described because you'll never get the, the there's, there's what, two, maybe three networks. Now there's 300. You, there's, you know, to get a 10 share of, of the... Of it's, the, yeah, it's a totally different thing now. Yeah. And, and that had to have been just unbelievable to, to have just been in front of nine million people. It, it was a pretty heady feeling, you know, as the word goes. and. A little overwhelming, like I said, and I think for 20 minutes I got a little full of myself, but I was lucky to get knocked back down by somebody real good, you know, and I went, whoa, okay, you know, I can see that, you know, I'm just a person like everybody else, you know, I put my pants on the same direction they do, and I tie my shoes the same way, and, you know, so I think I better rethink my, <laughs> my own big head here, you know, and, and I'm glad that happened to me. Um, but you did get to realize, though, as a person, that you wore riding a wave absolutely. that very few people ever got to get. Absolutely. I, and, and in 1968, it is said in 
in history books and things that we sold more records than any other artist, including the Beatles. I think that's single records, not entirely, but I know that in that year we sold about 14 or 15 million records. So for 1968, that was pretty good. And it's a nice little badge of honor to wear all these years later. Well, in, you know, and, and there again, today, 2007, do you think anybody's ever going to sell that many records again? I mean, actually I, physically sell? Because everybody's down by it, you know? That's right. You know, and there are those who say that very thing to me. I don't think they will say, in two years, will there be CDs anymore? I don't think that'll be the case exactly. But yes, the download thing is going to be huge. Um, there are those of us, and I mean all of us, that are kind of the dinosaurs. and. I know this because I do concerts all the time. Still, I am a baby boomer, and my generation still loves the music. They come out to the concerts, and they actually bring me an eight-track or a four-track. And they say, I still have this player, and I'd like you to sign this for me because we play this. You know, it's the eight-track player is by the jukebox in our game room or something, you know. So I don't think that people will discard their CD players for some time to come yet, but you're right that the download will take over. I mean, when you can, you know, have hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of music in some little thing, I'm all for it. Um, there was a time when technology, though, was a really good thing. Because, as you know, this had a devastating effect on the music industry because it, the music business is a business. Sure. And it's got to be. It, of course, it is that dreamland for, for those who get to participate, but it's still a bottom line as a business. And they had and they and they're still set up in a in a world that has to sell a tangible product in mm -hmm. order to make money. Yeah. When people can tap into it and steal it out of the air, they're they're you know and so they're all all the record labels used to be in Nashville are now two, you know, and it, and maybe one mm -hmm. before too long. But David Clayton Thomas told me that. Back in the 80s, when things were going to uh, to CD, it had gone from vinyl and an and eight track to cassette to CD. He said, and that, and he said, everything we sold is selling all over again because everybody who had a vinyl now has, you know, had to get an eight track, had to get a cassette, had to get a a, a, D, a CD. Well, I, fortunately, uh, I was told by some people at CBS that when they first released their initial 100 CD greatest hits, you know, of all their artists and things, uh, the Hollies and the Union Gap were right among the top selling for a while, and that was a good thing for people like us, you know, very good thing.